Hi class, we are moving into the um, sociological theories. Chapter 7 and 8 is this recording. And I want everybody to curtail your excitement. I know you just can't wait to hear my voice for the next 60 minutes. Just kidding. I'm going to try to keep it short. We are moving away from the individual theories of the positivist school that looked more at individual differences of offenders or what we were calling micro theories and now we're moving towards macro level theories or social structure theories, social process theories. Social st structure theorists or sociologists envision crime, delinquency, and deviant behavior as the product of social forces rather than of individual differences. They are similar in some of their beliefs, like positivism, in that they believe that these forces are pushing the individual and they are out of the control of the offender individual. Some of the most discussed and known social structure theories are what we call strain theories, or some theorists, they call them more frustration theories that an individual will feel. This impacts the lower class crime because of blocked opportunities. This is about the relationship between class and crime. Emile Durkheim and Robert Merton are two of the founders of strain theories, along with um, Robert Agnew that we'll talk about later. But Durkheim saw, saw crime as a result of the anonymy theory, which I'll address in a minute. He believed that crime was inevitable and as a result of rapid social change from industry and urbanization. He believed that all societies will have people who will violate the social norms and that crime has a place in every society. Merton, he drew from Durkheim's theories and he saw crime as a result of strains that individuals face and, and the result is how they respond to that strain. Society reacts to this conflict between identifying certain goals and the way in which they achieve these goals. One of Durkheim's major research studies was analyzing suicide rates. When he did this, he noticed that suicides not, up, not only go up during periods of economic depression, but also during periods of sharp economic growth. While to most, this might seem paradoxical to these other theorists, he pointed out that under the circumstances of economic depression, there's a confusion about social norms that frequently prevail. Meaning, during these, these, ty these types when the ec economy is down, the public doesn't know how to respond at that point. How do you, how do you make yourself better? How do you succeed in life when, you, when there's nothing out there to help you? From this information, Durkheim created his typology of suicide that includes four, four parts, the egoistic suicide, altruistic suicide, fatalistic suicide, and the anomic suicide. I will let you read on those yourself. I'm more excited to start talking to you about anonymy. And what I want to make sure and clear, clear to you, if you decide to use the strain theory for your, your research, and which a lot of students do because they go to it first thinking, oh, well, that's so easy. It just means there's a frustration. There's always a frustration with those that commit a crime. So I can explain any crime with this. But if you do, you have to go deep. You have to include anonymy in that. And you have to be able to explain how this state of normlessness that I'm getting ready to talk to you about is present for them to have committed that crime. And you have to back that up with research. Some theorists, as well as Durkheim, interpreted anonymy to mean a state of normlessness. Now, what is that, Dr. Black? Explain. It's probably more accurate to describe it as a condition where the traditional norms of society are no longer, no longer apply to anybody, possibly because of war, possibly because of depression. But the new norms haven't yet um, fully evolved, so it's a state of like a, a hole in the ground. The result of this anonymy state is a rise in the suicide rate and also a rise in the crime rate. Another way to look at this is say how people ought to behave 
towards each other that those rules have broken down and therefore people do not know what to expect from each other. It refers to the breakdown of social norms and it's a condition which those norms no longer control the activity or the behavior of those in society. It's really a lack of clear goals of how society should behave. And this frustration, this in turn leads to dissatisfaction among society, frustration, conflicts, deviance, criminal behavior. And as I said earlier, Merton, he followed Durkheim. Um, he borrowed the concept of anonymity to explain deviance. However, it differed a little bit from Durkheim. He disagreed that changes and dereg deregulation within society created anonymity. anonymity. Instead, he said that the ingredient was the ability of the social system to exercise control in the form of social norms. What he said in a simple terms is that anonymy is a split between goals and the means of achieving those goals because of the way that society is structured. And Martin presented five ways that people can adapt to the strain caused by this normlessness in society. And you make sure and review these within your book, but they are conforming, innovation, ritualism, retreatism, and rebellion. Cloward and Owen, they accepted a, a lot of Merton's arguments. They did agree that the U.S. culture emphasizes material success, right? Emphasizes the, the wealthy, um, having the more you have, uh, the more successful you are. But not everybody in, in the country has the same access to the legitimate legal means in order to achieve the same goals that others do. What they say is it's not enough to be motivated to deviate, but you have to have opportunity to do that. There has to be an opportunity available. And they maintain that Ill illegitimate means, the illegal way to do it, are not equally accessible the same as legitimate means are not accessible. So in order to either follow an illegitimate path or the legitimate path, the opportunity has to be there. And kind of like what we were saying in class the first first week, Owen and Cloward, they concentrated their theory on one specific group. And that's some of the issues that we have with criminology is we only have one theory to explain this group and we have another theory to explain this group and that's why we look at the general theory of crime and some of the integrated theories in order to be able to explain all types of behavior at some level or, or other. But their focus was on the lower class male youths in large urban centers. In other words, gang activity from juveniles. Now, pay attention, this is important, and you're going to see it on your, on your quiz. They maintain that there are different types of lower class neighborhoods, which we can all pretty much guess that. Each of those gives rise to a different type of this delinquent subculture. For instance, a, a stable neighborhood, even if it is lower income, where communities know each other, use are socialized, into a criminal subculture. In other words, the the adult role models are criminals and they are like mentors to the young delinquents, young juveniles before they become delinquent. So these adults are, are like their teachers. They learn these techniques from being around them, the close relationship they have. Now on the other hand, if we look at a neighborhood that is less stable, we have what they called the conflict subculture. And this, this culture is more likely to develop. These are neighborhoods that are characterized by this social disorganization. You're going to see a lot of this. Socially disorganized communities are those that have a, a lot of movement. In other words, we have 
immigrants and, and migrants that are moving into this area and therefore those that have been living there will move out and so there's not a lot of um, loyalty to the neighborhood so you'll see a lot of disorganization a lot of windows broken and we'll we talk about this later the window the broken window theory but you, you just see this disorganization where nobody really cares about their community anymore and the last typology that they they talked about is the retreatist and these are individuals according to them that live in these lower class communities and they're unsuccessful in what everything they do they they cannot succeed whether it's through legitimate means or illegitimate means and they're considered these double failures and so a lot of times they turn to drugs alcohol or something else to just get by now a newer version of the general strain theory and this is a, a term that he uh, coined which you'll see a lot is GST but it was developed by Robert Agnew in 1992 and he really saw the prior versions of strain theory as limited within their research. He expands the definition of strain and the types of adaptations that individuals will use in rep response to the strain. He specifies more precisely that the relationship between strain and delinquency are impacted by a number of factors that are likely to inf in influence someone's choice of delinquent versus non-delinquent. He identified these strains into three main types, but he did say that all of these could produce anger and frustration. The first one is failing to achieve any any positive goals. The second one is a result of the removal of any previously attained, any previously achieved positive goals or achievements. And the third type is produced by exposure to those negative stimuli. According to Agnew, strain produces pressure towards deviance and crime. And he believed that individuals adapt to strain in various ways. For instance, by trying to ignore or minimize it, by taking responsibility for it, and thereby blaming themselves, by taking revenge on, on those they perceive as causing the strain, or even taking drugs or drinking alcohol to temporarily, ex to temporarily escape from the strain. Remember, not all adaptations are criminal or even deviant. He theorized that whether an individual responds to the strain in his or her life with deviant or criminal behavior depends on a number of internal and external constraints that he called conditioning factors. When, when someone cannot adapt is when the strain can cause the criminal behavior. Agnew distinguished between these strains with objective strains and subjective strains. That objective strains are events or conditions that are disliked by most members of a given group. And subjective strains are events or conditions that are disliked by the people who are experiencing those, those strains. Steve Messner and Robert Rosenfield, they supported another macro level perspective that's similar to what Merton did but they used the American dream to express stress that leads to deviant behavior for them the American dream that which everyone wants to achieve causes crime because it causes stress on the individual success to reach that American dream and therefore they want to become financially wealthy and successful so this in turn causes the anonymy, the lack of the lack of morals in society. No morals in order to learn from. Their American dream theory focuses on achievement, individualism, materialism, and universalism. I'll let you read those and understand. As we continue to focus on this paradigm, around strain theories, we need to be aware of the assumption that delinquency and criminal behavior are essentially problems 
that these, these theorists found in the lowest socioeconomic level of our structure system. There are many policy implications to the strain theory, and we're going to talk about some of those in class on, on Wednesday. Social ecology focuses on the person's relation to the social environment. For criminology, this entails the study of the spatial distribu distrib distribution of crime and delinquency. Social ecology grew from the Chicago School of Thought, which originated with the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago and, and Robert Park, who is a renowned sociologist. The focus of sociological attention came to rest on the problem that really focused on the lives of the city dwellers, those in the inner city. The goal of these sociologists was to study and explain deviance and social problems so that they could devise a practical means of eliminating them. That's what we're always trying to do as criminologists. The Chicago sociologists, they emphasized the external sources of social problems, such as the social disorganization of city life, like we talked about a couple slides ago. Their solutions rested not in treating the individuals, but rather in making changes in society. Park, as well as his colleagues, Ernest Burgess and Lewis Worth, they identified several distinct zones that they expanded out in a pattern of concentric circles from the center of the city. We see this in the concentric zone model. They found that not all urban zones are equally plagued by crime, alcoholism, high rates of mental illness, and other problems. In, instead, the further they found that the further one moved away from the city center or the zone of one, the lower the incident of social problems. According to them and the Chicago School, this was a result of the social disorganization that characterized the inner city areas. Remember, social disorganization, we talked about that a little while ago. They found that it was caused by rapid social change that disrupts the normally smooth operation in any system. More specifically, Sean McKay, they reported that the neighborhoods with the worst delinquency problems also had the highest rates of other serious problems. They found and believed that the foundation of adult criminal career was laid early in life, so the best way to control crime is what? To prevent juvenile delinquency. They found that the neighborhoods that had the worst issues and were more economically disadvantaged were those inner zones one and two. They found that these neighborhoods were in transition. They were undergoing the process of invasion. Uh, dominance and succession. On one hand, the, the neighborhoods were being invaded by newly arrived immigrants, as I said earlier, and groups, and this resulted in the flight of most of the current residents to leave. The new groups, they didn't have the loyalty or the resources, resources to live in any better areas of the city, so they had to face the dif difficulty of adjusting to life in a different society, and, and they did. They moved around a lot, which caused this uh, disassociation, this disorganization. We're going to move now and talk about the social process theories in Chapter 8. These theories focus on uh, crime and that the emphasis and the role of social learning or socialization in the development of criminal behavior. And Another way to refer to these, these theories is really learning how to be a criminal. That is a great way to, to explain this. These theories focus on what is taught, what, it, what do you acquire through socialization. Those who do the socializing, whom sociologists, they call the agents of socialization. Agents of socialization 
influence others over the course of our lives. Very simply, according to these theorists, criminal behavior is learned through your interactions with others, and criminal and non-criminal behaviors are learned in the same way. And Edward Sutherland is somebody that we're going to talk a lot about. He is generally regarded as the leading criminologist of his generation. Sutherland is best known for his study of white-collar crime, his life's history analysis of the professional thief, but mostly for his theory of differential association and the elements that it involved. And this is a purely sociological explanation of criminal behavior. And symbolic interactionalism really prompted him to examine these views of criminal behavior, both favorable and unfavorable. This will probably be the easiest theory that we study because it's based on uh, these nine straightforward propositions that he stated. These are in your book and I'm, I'm not going to read those. Now, at the beginning, he makes it very clear, Sutherland, that criminality is not inherited. It is learned in the same way that any other behavior is learned through interpersonal communications and social interactions with those most int intimate to you. According to Sutherland, a person becomes deviant because of an excess of definitions favorable to the violation of the law over those other definitions that are unfavorable to the violation of law. And those nine principles are listed here and here. And according to Sutherland, there's actually two theories and you should decide which one that you agree with most and that his theory suggests that associations with deviant peers will lead to criminal behavior because those individuals will learn from those violations of law, from those individuals. The other explanation is that individuals who engage in criminal behavior will seek out people that also engage in criminal behavior. Social learning theory developed by Robert Burgess and uh, Ronald Akers is a revision of Sutherland's work that uses the central concept concepts and principles that he had in his differential association of modern behaviorism. This theory is a, is a general processual explanation for all criminal and delinquent behavior. Like Sutherland, Akers maintains that criminal behavior is a learned behavior. However, the way it is learned, he argues, is through direct operant conditioning and imitation or modeling of others. The, the principle of operant conditioning can probably uh, be easily understood if you think about um, Pavlov's dogs that were tra trained and conditioned to salivate when they heard a bell ring. In this kind of conditioning, called classical conditioning, the behavioral response is elicited by a prior stimulus. And according to Akers, though the form the behavior takes and its frequency of reoccurrence depend on another type of conditioning, behavior is learned or conditioned as a result of the effects, outcomes, or consequences of the environment. In other words, according to Akers, behavior may be developed or extinguished through imitation or modeling. Models can be real or fictitious, and observers may be just passive onlookers or active participants in the activity that they are modeling. And according to Akers, whatever type of behavior, whether it's deviant or non-deviant, the way it's required and persists depends on past and present rewards or punishments for that behavior. Culture conflict is a theme within the differential association theory. Sociologist Thelen in the late 30s, he thought that crime is an outcome of a clash between cultures. Selen saw this in two forms, the primary culture conflict when a society is homogenous or alike and 
the law represents really the consensus of all the members. And then he has the secondary culture conflict, which is a society that is heterogeneous, meaning that there's different subcultures. And in that type of society, the dominant culture will prevail. The subcultural theories. Merton argued that criminal behavior is an outgrowth of the strains that people experience because of their particular positions within the social structure. A number of theorists, however, have applied this idea to study one specific form of criminal behavior, as I mentioned before, like, for instance, gang delinquency, but others have also extended it to adult crime as well. And a, a couple of those are Marvin Wolfgang and Franco Furukudu, where they studied an analysis of homicides, in particular passion crime, of adults that are not premeditated and not caused by any psychosis or other serious mental disorder. After this study, they found that most of these homicides that are committed are by relatively homogeneous group, young, non-white, lower class males. They stated that the value system of this type of group, this group particularly, constitute what they termed the subculture of violence. The definition of subculture of violence, this will be on your, on your quiz, is a set of attitudes or social expectations that favor the use of violence in a variety of different situations. Now, Elijah Anderson, he, this is a relatively new theory. He's introduced a new approach to explain the, the disproportionate violence by African Americans in lower socioeconomic neighborhoods. He, toy, he coined the code, the code of the street and said it differs from the subculture of violence and other culture conflict theories that preceded it in identifying the origins of the cultural content. Anderson brought forth a connection to social structure theories saying that the street code develops in response to poverty, discrimination, family disruption, and other structural problems. According to Anderson, individuals committed to the street code feel compelled to risk their life in a violent confrontation if they've been dissed. The code requires the resident to project toughness, engage in violent posturing, and be willing to resort to violence at any turn. And Walter Miller, like Cohen, studied delinquent gangs in this subculture. And according to him, gangs form in the lower class community itself. In his view, Cohen examined lower class gang delinquency from the perspective of the middle class. And that's why he characterized it as non-utilitarian and malicious and negative, negativistic. But Miller said that such behavior is stable and essentially ritualized. It serves to support and maintain the basic features of the lower class way of life. And he identified the context of the lower class cultural system with his six focal concerns. Trouble, toughness, smartness, excitement, fate, and autonomy. Okay, everybody, stay with us. We've only got three more slides. We now move to what are called control theories. And the techniques of neutralization were coined by Gresham Sykes and David Matzo. When they looked at the traditional positivist theorist and those theories, what they pointed out was that if those theories of crime are correct, that means that some individuals that are born to be a criminal would be a criminal all the time, no matter what you did. And also those that were not born as a criminal would never deviate and never become a criminal. According to them, adolescent behavior runs along a continuum with total freedom at one end and total restraint constraint at the other. Rather than juveniles locating themselves any consistently at one pole or the other, adolescents facilitate, they move between these two extremes. They drift. And this drift into delinquency is facilitated by learning justifications or rationalizations that neutralize the constraint of norms 
of behavior and thus legitimate deviation. Sykes and Matza called these justifications or rationalizations their techniques of neutralization. And you will probably see these terms on your quiz. Travis Hershey in 1969 wrote his book, The Causes of Delinquency, where he presented his own version of the control theory. It used to be called Hershey's control theory, and now it's, it's labeled the social bond theory. In one sentence, what he was saying is individuals with strong social bonds are unlikely to engage in delinquency. And he specified these four elements of social bond, attachment, commitment, involvement, and belief. The most important one, according to Travis, is attachment. So you need to review those and understand what those four mean. Make sure you understand, and we're going to talk about this more in class, that these four elements are interrelated. In other words, someone who is strongly attached to his or her parents and cares about their feelings will also likely to express a strong belief in the moral validity of social rules. Also, if an individual has a high stake in conformity, you know, a high level of commitment, they're likely to be actively involved in conventional activities. And the social bond theory uh, moved into Michael Godfordson's and Travis Hershey's The General Theory of Crime, which they rooted their, th their theory on the notion of low self-control. They argued that crime is a product of a lack of socialization or learning, and they accepted the classical assumption that crime is a natural consequence of unrestrained human tendencies to seek pleasure and avoid pain, other words, a lack of self-control. According to them, people who deviate lack self-control. People lacking self-control have a concrete here-and-now orientation and have difficulty deferring gratification. They tend to lack diligence, tenacity, or persistence in, in a course of action. They also may seem adventuresome, active, and physical. They identified the six elements of self-control, impulsiveness, simple task, risk-seeking, physicality, self-centeredness, and temper. Make sure you review those. You will see those, too, on your quiz. Sorry for the length. I did my best to cut it down, but this is a lot of important information.